Um, let's get the recording going here. So we are, um, whoops, let's get this back to the start. Again, History 2002. Um, I am Professor Kip Curtis and we are getting underway. This is our first lecture. As I printed out my notes this morning, I noticed I've got quite a bit of material to cover and so I'm gonna keep my pace through this lecture, but if you have questions or issues, please feel free to use the chat box and my TA Ives is ready and waiting to answer and address questions as they come up. Uh, and if I have time and see them, I will do the same. Um, but I do think I have a good hour and 20 minutes of material today to cover. I want to remind you that you um, are counted here with your screen on, I mean, with your camera on, unless you've gotten special permission and, and a couple of people have. Um, so we'd like to see you uh, as you listen to this lecture and, and follow this class. Um, let me just remind us all about the architecture of the course. It's um, important and Ives, I don't, I think you can let people in as well, you're a co-host. I'm gonna turn off that function for myself so that I can just focus on the lecture. Um, so this is our map for the first unit. Unit is uh, launching the modern. It's, uh, we're covering a period of time from about 1848 uh, to about 1898, 1850 to 1890, roughly speaking, um, in terms of the two units that were covered. And the first one is launching the modern. So let's just remember uh, some of from last time, and you can use the chat box on this. What do we mean by modern? What are we talking about? when we're talking about modern. And it is, I'll just remind us all, the focus of the whole course is making America this. Um, industry, so industry, what kind of um, industry would be economic? Modernization, so don't, as we kind of dig deeper into all of these things, make sure you don't allow a term to stand in the way of, of kind of understanding what the underlying concept is. Um, but modernization, in, yep, innovation and technology, steady economic growth. What about on the social side? And I'm gonna keep moving. Um, Really quickly, though, we're we're talking today about the modernization, first of all, of the American state, its modern geography in particular, um, which took form after 1848, the beginning of a modern economy. And one of the keys, and we'll talk about it this time a little bit, but a lot more next time, is the energy sources that go into play in that economy. So an industrial economy can be based on organic energy sources, or it can be based on fossil fuel energy sources. And really, the modern begins to emerge when we've shifted to fossil fuel energy sources and minerals as a particular a, a particularly important source of our material culture and our material world itself. Um, we'll look in this section at the beginning of a modern social order which is the acceptance of greater diversity um, and we'll look at the modernization of the political parties in particular the codification of the Democratic Party and the Republican parties around the Civil War. Um, and as we have seen in events in the last week, those battles are still playing out in people's minds and, and in our public spaces. Um, so it's really important to know all of those. Um, we are, I'm gonna just jump right into this, into this um, exploitation. This is our first lecture in the theme environment. Oops, things are falling in my office. Let's just remember for a minute what we mean by the environment. Okay, and I'm gonna, you, I talked about these last time, a little more detail first, and we're gonna spend quite a bit of time on this today, geography. Um, it matters what space is contained in what is called the United States. That state isn't just an idea and isn't just people, but it is first and foremost a place on earth and a place on earth with boundaries and co contours and dimensions that are part of that nation. And so we're, we're gonna look today at the way in which space really changed for the United States as a, as a pattern of practice in the 19th century, and particularly in the early, early 19th century. And that ended with the beginning of the modern 
period. So the physical spaces are, are a part of this environmental theme. And in each one of these six environmental lectures, that'll be part of what we're asking about. We will also, and I'll be talking about this as well, really looking at the way in which natural resources and, and the shape of the landscape changed the way in which Americans did their frontiers this year. But natural resources is another critical uh, component of the environment theme. And we mean soils and minerals and forests and wild animals and grazing lands and oceans and et cetera, all of the various things we can take from the environment and, and turn into stuff um, itself. So we know, knowing where that exists, and that's what this map shows, helps us understand a little bit about what options were available for, for people when they were in those places. The environment, as I've said before, but I want to reiterate, doesn't determine the outcome, but it sets constraints. And there are certain things you can only do in certain places. Although as we get more modern and hypermodern, place becomes less and less important, although it never disappears. But you know, you can't grow corn everywhere. You can't mine everywhere. There are things in the natural world that limit what you can do, climate, soils, topography, et cetera. And there are some things in nature that only exist in very specific places like gold, uh, like fresh water, um, grazing land, et cetera. And you can't create those where they don't exist. Um, the third, or rather the third theme is what we might call the environment itself, right? When we talk about the environment theme here, we're talking about things like climate, weather, and the ecosystems that result from climate and weather. And if you've done any basic rudimentary environmental science, you know that there's a, there's a clear relationship between temperature and annual rainfall and the kind of ecology that exists in any region. So those things are intertwined. Um, and we'll look at those as well. What's the ecosystem, climate conditions, et cetera, that are uh, the constraints that are underway. Um, and we might just note when we look at this, the biggest difference in experience for pioneering Americans after the middle of the 19th century were the new climates that they uh, encountered. And so if you just look at the, the green and then the red on the left in that picture on the left, it was all very similar in terms of annual precipitation until you get to a certain point in the American geography. And then it's a whole different ball game, right? Arid plains, deserts, high mountain plateaus, rocky rugged mountains, um, and then rainforests up in the upper left. Um, so what happens when you try to farm in a region without rainfall, right? You, you can't. What happens when you clear cut a rainforest, right? You, you lose enormous amounts of biodiversity. So in each of the environmental lectures, we're gonna look at the interaction, first and foremost, of these three layers of material reality. Geography, um, space, the natural resources, what's in that space, and the ecological conditions and changes. How's the weather? What's the topography? What's your natural ecosystem or biome? These three questions deal with the physical reality of place in that place. The third is about our imagination, or sorry, the fourth, the fourth layer. It's, it's got to do with what takes place in our heads and our imaginations about nature, the environment, and the natural world. And in fact, some historians argue that it's ideas that drive everything, and that this is the most important question to ask about all of it. So you could think about imaginations of the American West in the 19th century, which, which imagined it as this un incomplete place that was actually undeveloped, so it needed civilization, right, or manifest destiny. You could think about the way in which, you can look in these pictures, you don't see Native people, in which Native people were imagined out of the landscape and, and out of these spaces. Um, so ideas are not incidental, and they, through this theme, both emerge out of experience and they drive action itself. So sometimes our ideas reflect what happened and we do so well. Sometimes our ideas drive us to do things blindly and not actually see what's in front of us. And we'll look at both of those types of things. So we can think about the environment as this contributing factor to our whole history and development and a limiting factor to our history and development. There are a lot of natural resources in, our, in the landscape that became the United States, but climate 
and distance and the market value of things complicates getting them, right? So they're not just valuable on their own. Under the theme of the environment, we explore the central questions of a field that I studied in um, called environmental history. And this has kind of been emerging in the last 50 years or so. It began in the 1970s, the field of environmental history, just trying to figure out what was going on with environmentalism and like why we were at that point destroying the environment. But over the last 50 years, it's matured into a very critical way of understanding the, some of the major causes in human history, which are outside of human control. And that's what each of these themes touch on, um, except for the ideas themselves. And those we do have some control over. So critical analysis of space, resources, the environment, and ideas about nature. And that's what we'll be doing today as well. So back to the lecture. Um, today, we're going to look at the environmental theme in the years between the war with Mexico in 1846 and 18. 1848, and then 50 years later in the war with Spain, 1898. So roughly a 50 year period of time, um, which marked the final expansion and really the final frontier period of the United States. Um, we'll go all the way back to 1846. So very quickly, you, you may or may not know much about the war with Mexico. Um, does anybody know, and you put this in chat, why we went to war? with Mexico. And I'm going to just keep moving on this, but um, at the time, it didn't make sense. Mexico was a bigger empire than the United States. Uh, they had more of a military. They had um, a lot of support behind them. They were kind of the greater than. Um, and I'm just going to look. Texas was a part of it, and Texas kind of led partly into it. But in fact, um, they and so Mexico was centered here in central Mexico, but it had these outposts um, up into region. There was some regions that the United States had arbitrarily claimed, um, but more importantly, and so this is a recent study really worth reading by Brian DeLay, War of a Thousand Deserts. He argues that this wasn't even about the United States and Mexico, but it was about the uncertainty in this region where the United States had moved its native people in, in the Trail of Tears. It had moved Cherokee. It had also moved a whole lot of uh, upper Midwest native tribes to this sort of exterior region of the United States for them to stay permanently, what would become Oklahoma. And um, uh, the Indians that lived there, the Comanche, started attacking them and really essentially started taking the provisions from them that were being given to them by the United States government, which was part of the, the, the deal with removing them to there. The Comanche were also attacking South into Mexico and bothering the Mexicans. And so what DeLay argues is in a really interesting way, one of the last independent indigenous groups in the United States drew the two new nation states in North America into war with each other in 1846, because they both saw, thought the other side was using the Comanches. Um, and so the, the, for, for the Mexicans, it was about defending their territory from this incursion that was being encouraged by the United States. For the United States, it was about a much bigger idea. And this was about manifest destiny and about this idea that, you know, ultimately, we are going to occupy all of North America. Um, and in fact, once, once we went to war, you can see some of our um, military went all the way down to Mexico City and there were plans to take all of Mexico as well. This was sort of a, okay, we're gonna finally fulfill our destiny here. Um, but ultimately they um, ended the war by drawing the line that we know today along the Rio Grande, a little bit further north um, up into Arizona, you see that dark gray area. So when Mexico and the United States reached an armistice in 1848, Mexico agreed to withdraw from this territory and cede it to the United States in the Treaty of the Guadalupe Hidalgo. Um, and then uh, five years later in the Gadsden Purchase, and this was really for railroads, we added that little bottom part of Arizona and New Mexico. This gave us all of the Southwest and in particular California, and by 1843, the modern contiguous United States is established, right? It's set in place. Our geography is not going to change in terms of the contiguous United States. And this huge region awaits American transformation. 
1848, poised on the brink. 50 years later, Frederick Jackson Turner, who you see pictured here, who is the president of the American Historical Society, gave an address to the American Historical Society about this region. And he said, the frontier is closed. It's done. We've finished. It's over. This was 1892. He based this on the 1890 census, which said one person per square mile ends the frontier. A frontier needs to have at least um, fewer than one person per, per square mile. But for Turner, this wasn't a moment of celebration. This was a moment of concern and a moment of fear because he argued America had become what it was. It had become so robustly democratic, so engaged in its citizenship, so forward looking in its progress because of its frontier experience, because of its pioneering nature, and because of all of the efforts from the very beginning to turn nature into civilization. Turner argued, and he picked up from a theme, a theme from Thomas Jefferson, I'll talk about in a minute, that frontiers make people virtuous, that when American settlers moved into these uncivilized, undeveloped areas, and turn them into places and towns and communities and homes, they created democracy from the ground up and they came to embody it themselves. And so for Turner and for a lot of thinkers, having a frontier available was necessary to keep regenerating American democratic strength and our power as a nation. Um, and so what Turner asked at that point was, who are we? if we don't have a frontier any longer? And this was a, a really challenging question in the 1890s. Who are we if we don't have a frontier any longer? But it turned out um, there were more lands to conquer. And so by 1898, um, we lands and regions and seas, um, we see the United States take its first press out into the global world um, in its Spanish-American War in 1898. Um, and uh, we'll get to this in another lecture, in the political lecture, but, but just quickly, we picked up our first colony in 1898. We went from being a, a, a colonial nation that prided itself on never holding a nation colony to making the Philippines our first colony. Um, we, we appropriated Puerto Rico, still stands in a territorial status. And we exercised and claimed control over all of South America. We claimed control over the hemisphere itself and started a pattern of intervention in nations in Central and South America um, toward US interest. And that pattern continues to this day. We annexed Hawaii, it wouldn't become a state yet, but we'd pull it in and Guam, which still sits in a territorial status, but essentially, 1898 was the last. We had Alaska, it hadn't become a state, but it was in our holdings at that point as well. So by the end of this period, geographically speaking, the United States had its modern global presence firmly established. Tremendous geographical change, tremendous change in underneath it as well. Almost half a, half a century doubled the country um, and integrated economically and politically twice the space it had had 50 years earlier. So the question for today is, how did the United States settle its far west, right? That, that, that past that green line, we will call the far western frontier, the area that it became, that became occupied and engaged actively after 1850. Um, how do we do it? And these are our kind of key interpretive issues as we think about this region. Um, what's different about this far Western frontier compared to the near Western frontier, the region we live in, in the, in the Midwest? The second is a question about the environment. How did the environment shape this experience? And the third is how did the experience shape the environment? What ended up happening out there with the land? as well. Um, so let's think briefly about where this final addition of land in the middle of the century fits into the larger history of the United States. We're going to start there. So geography. This is a really useful map. We'll see it a bunch of times in a bunch of lectures. It's the demographics of United States population in 1850. We want to note 
It does not include indigenous people. It does not include Mexicans. So those white spaces to the left and into Mexico don't actually account for people who live there. But what we see in this is the pattern of United States settlement after 130 years of British colonial and then American occupation of this region. 1850 population development on the ground is what you're looking at. Um, you'll notice it's the densest up in the Northeast, right up in the Northeast where we have some pretty significant cities at this point and industrialization built on water power. I'll talk about this. We'll notice that it's decidedly sort of north-south oriented with a, with a population core running kind of up a spine across the Pennsylvania Appalachians and then the East Coast there. Um, and that Mississippi is a, the, a kind of primary internal route um, to, the, to the heartland itself. Um, and you might imagine an urban industrial core taking root in the Northeast up there, right? That's what's happening. And then a resource agriculture and raw material periphery in the South and in the Midwest where you have those lower populations. Um, this, the, the fact is that the addition of Mexico, Northern Mexico in 1848 in the United States in the middle of the century um, wasn't a novel event for the United States, right? The expansion of the United States, I said this earlier, of the territory had been the rule from the very start. And what we're seeing on this map through these colors is this patterned growth. Um, in the United States, we can imagine it as three major significant changes starting at the end of the 18th century and running through the middle of the, the uh, 19th century. The first, of course, is the original lands that we gained from Great Britain when we created a nation. What we want to remember was that experience was an experience of expansion itself. Because as colonies, the British prevented Americans from crossing the Appalachians and moving into what would become the first Northwest Territory, the Ohio River Valley. And that was one of the, 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 the frictions between the colonists and Great Britain. Um, and in fact, as soon as the war started, Daniel Boone started moving settlers across the Cumberland Gap and into the Ohio R River Valley and started settling this whole region. So when the war was done, that whole region became av available. So with the origin of the United States, it literally doubled in territory and pioneering and moving people out into that land was one of the first acts and, and led to a whole lot of friction. Um, during that period, oops, let me go back. During that period, the, the federal government added the land survey, began surveying land and created a means for at, handing this land over to settlers and established the pattern of settlement that would be disrupted by the 1850 edition, but until 1850 settled everything. And that was that the government surveyed huge sections of land, 106, 300, uh, 640 acres at a time, divided them into four and sold them through the land office. And this was Thomas Jefferson's idea. Um, this was in fact an idea that was the same idea that influenced Frederick Jackson Turner a century later because Jefferson thought when he saw what, it, what was happening in the Ohio Valley and what had happened since 1775, he thought he had discovered the engine of strong republicanism or a, st a strong democracy. He called it the agrarian ideal, A-G-R-A-R-I-A-N ideal, the agrarian ideal. And, and he and some French philosophers theorized that working the land, turning wilderness into farms, somehow turned people into virtuous human beings as well. And that that activity was really helpful for a nation state that was getting started in the way the United States was. In fact, Jefferson was so taken by this idea that um, in the third year of his presidency, he was the third president, he purchased from the French, who was already in trouble because Napoleon was fighting like heck over in Europe and he needed to rid himself of this anyways. He purchased an uncertain amount of land in the Louisiana purchased. Um, Jefferson, when he bought it, estimated that a thousand years of settlement would be possible for American farmers after we acquired this land. Um, it wasn't clear where it ended, 
So this is why the Lewis and Clark expedition was sent up the Missouri and eventually up and over the Lolo Pass and down the Columbia and found their way to the Pacific. But this addition in 1803 then geographically doubled the nation's size again. Suddenly there was brand new land to be had and to be had in the way the federal government believed it should be, which is survey it and put it on the market, sell it to settlers. Um, for people who had lived through the revolution by 1803, the United States had doubled in 1807, 16 years later, doubled in 1803. Um, and then it settled down for a bit. And most of the energy focused the steady westering of settlement, the, the surveying of land a little bit further west and the movement of farms and families and eventually towns and settlements, gradually, gradually, westward. Um, and in the east, a growing intensification of an industrial supply chain. Um, and it started to create in the region a um, uh, specialties in a sense. So you had industrialization in the northeast, you had farming and staples, farming like, like corn and pork in the midwest, and then the slave-based staple economy of the south, cotton, rice, and indigo. Um, and as this westering continued in through the Louisiana Purchase, there grew this argument about whether or not that land should be handed over to people who work it as free men or handed over to people who work it with slaves. And this national debate, you know, they drew the Mason-Dixon line first to kind of carry this out, ultimately culminated in a civil war. So this addition of land and the fights over it um, really heightened the arguments about uh, slavery in the United States. And, and one can argue um, led to the Civil War. But before we got there, um, there was this final resolution of these Western lands, these punctuations that took place. Um, so after 40 years, two generations of settlement um, in this kind of Jeffersonian agrarian ideal, the energy to expand again grew. And it came from the Southern plantation owners who wanted more cotton. They went into Texas to get more cotton land. Cotton was booming. Demand for cotton was, was extremely high because of Northeastern industrialization. Um, and there was a growing interest in reaching the Pacific. It had been there in the 1820s and 30s. It emerged again in the 1840s. We, we really needed the Pacific in order to access the biggest markets in the world, and that was China. Like the, our, our eyes were set on China by the 1840s. And, and this idea of manifest destiny in the 1840s bubbled up again. Um, and we can remember now, if we look at these earlier expansions, it really did seem to people who'd lived through these periods of time that it was our manifest destiny to occupy this continent. We've done so more rapidly than the Spanish who'd been here much longer than us. We'd done so with more staying power than the French who'd been here longer than us. And so it just seemed logical that we were the right people for this land. And that's, that's where those ideas came from. It is our destiny as a nation. Look at our success. It's our destiny as a nation to occupy this space. And so suddenly, almost at once, First, Florida becomes a state, and you often don't think about Florida as a Western state, but it sure as heck is. Cows and sugar, um, and you get the vacationing along the coast, but mostly it's a, it's a commodity region um, that's filled with beef and sugar and mining. Phosphate mining takes place there. In 1845, Texas was also annexed, a questionable move by the United States. Texas had declared itself to be its own country, um, the, the Republic of Texas, why the Lone Star State. But it was afraid Mexico was going to invade. And there were cotton resources there that were becoming increasingly important for United States economy um, and, and the industrialization in the Northeast. So we claimed it, um, which led to some friction with, the, with Mexico and friction over this territory. At the, in the following year, we sat down at the table with Great Britain and we negotiated the Oregon territories. There had been an ongoing battle about whether the line that was ours was down here or was up here where Canada begins. And we got them to agree to this Northern line, which gave us clear title to lands that we knew connected us to the Pacific at that point. And that was part of the point. And into this territory came the very last agrarian pioneering 
effort. And these are the Conestoga wagons that made it all the way across the United States into the Willamette Valley and settled this very lush, well-watered valley in Idaho, the, the Willamette Valley, in the same agrarian way that all of settlement and frontier had taken place. Um, and then we went to war with Mexico, 1846. 1848, as I talked about before, left us with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. That's that green, where the green line is. And then the Gadsden Purchase in order to add a railroad south of that river in 1853. And so by 1853, in terms of geography, space, the United States contiguous is done, right? So here we are in 1850, and there's that huge blank space on the map. Um, we learned, we talked about this before, that, that the population is concentrated mostly in the East in this nation so far, mostly in, uh, in and then especially in the area around Western Pennsylvania. Um, we know that the Erie Canal has opened the Midwest already into this region and so created these connections. And we can see the results of it in, in this increasing population in the Midwest itself. Um, the Lowell, Massachusetts and textiles are the industries that are up in uh, the, the Northeast, but it is intimately, this, this Northeast engine is intimately connected to the Southern slave system and the production of cotton. Um, and that's, that's why cotton's price is going up and that's why the pressure on text. So slavery and industry and agrarianism are all really intertwined at this point in time. And we see in the, in the first half of the 19th century, slavery actually intensifies because of the kind of industrialization and because of the textile industrial revolution in New York. Um, the upper Midwest in Ohio, farming is intensifying as well, but we also see Pittsburgh beginning to emerge. And we'll get to that next time, but we're beginning to see something new emerging in this upper Midwest around coal and iron, steel and copper and, and railroads, which are just getting started as well. But what we're looking at here in a really interesting way is this spatial expression of an organically energy sourced free market capitalist society. The, the patterns in the landscape there emerged out of the landscape itself because of the demands of an intensifying market and a growing market and because of the conditions of the land itself. So we don't get an even distribution of people. We get these really interesting concentrations of economic activities in these urbanized places and then growing rural supplies for those urbanized places. And we could think about the rural and the urban together as these sort of intense market activities centered on the urban places themselves. And, and if we think about cities actually, we, we think about them in economic terms, we recognize that they play a really critical role. They put a lot of people together in one place for market exchange. And that, that tends to be their function, right? They concentrate markets because when you have a lot of exchange happening in one place, you get efficiencies of transport, right? And efficiencies of exchange. And those efficiencies lead to greater profit. So if you can get everything into one place, you've suddenly shortened your supply chain and figured out how to get everything back out to the places they need to go. And so we see this happening in this period as well, this sort of stitching together of this growing economic activity and cities growing as a result. And these market relationships then pushing back out into the country and demanding more resources, looking for more resources. All of this happened without planning, the way we think about planning today. There were no, there were no business zones and residential zones. There was none of what we would recognize um, as planning today. Cities were in the United States, the results of markets and the people they participate, that participated in them and the geography of those places. And they formed this core. And you, you might wanna think about this idea um, of it's, it's a world economy theory, but it operates in the United States, I think in this period of time of core periphery in an economy. Core is the center of the markets, the place where people have money to spend, money to invest. It's the place where you have government and influence and the periphery are the less populated resource producing regions that send their resources into those um, markets and into those urban systems and then in turn purchase from them as well. The South under slavery was part of the periphery. 
The upper Midwest also, although it was in transition at this point is still an economic periphery um, to the East Coast, the Northeast itself. Um, so all of this activity, 40 years of intensifying um, and developing in this region turned out um, was just prelude to what the United States was actually going to become. And, and all of what I've just described, this first organic pioneering expansion is, is still tends to be the idea we hold about what the United States did as it became itself. But, but there were some major differences after 1850. And, and one of them is out here in California. So if you had been looking at this map, you noted um, that out there in the middle of California, there's 100,000 people um, all of the sudden and all this blank space in between. Um, the seedbed of the future in California and in gold mining. But before I get to California, I wanna look at the West, this far West in a little more detail um, and compare it to the East in some significant ways. So the opening of this land meant that this organic society that had grown up in well-watered agrarian landscapes were suddenly facing a place where there was just radical differences. Less rain in most of the places, except in the high mountains themselves. Um, more higher, more diverse, more complicated mountain ranges lacing throughout the region. Um, and then this diverse set of coastal climates where there are very few natural harbors. It is, it is an antithesis to what you saw in the East. And for a nation that had been used to well-watered prairies and deep, healthy soils, um, the new space that came with the Far West was a new puzzle altogether. Um, part of it was this region, the Great Plains, and we'll start with that. Now, the Great Plains had actually been part of the United States since the um, uh, Louisiana purchase. Throughout the whole intensification of the East, in fact, this land was, had remained unsettled. And if you looked at maps before the 1850, it was marked and labeled as the Great American Desert. And it was the place to which the American government removed indigenous people when they were clearing them from the land as we moved westward with our agrarian settlement. They kept depositing them on the Great Plains, in particular down south in Oklahoma. Um, this was considered wasteland, right? Why? Well, very simply because it didn't get enough rain. Um, the mountains, all the weather systems move from west to east across the continent. These rains pull all, these mountains pull all of the water out of the air before it gets to this region of the country. Um, and so there is no rainfall, less than 20 inches a year. Um, and by comparison, Ohio gets about 40 inches a year. So half of Ohio's rainfall. And anybody who's studied ecology knows that when you get less than 20 inches of rainfall of a year, the biome, the ecosystem changes from a forest ecosystem to a grassland ecosystem. And that's why the Great Plains are grasslands top to bottom. And in fact, this is what they look like. 500 miles um, from east to west. So two times as wide as Ohio and eight times as long north to south as Ohio and flat as a board from top to bottom. They contain some of the deepest, richest soils found on earth, but there's not enough water coming out of the sky to turn them into agriculture. And so they can't be farmed and they couldn't be farmed. And, and so the Western frontier um, that had been pressing slowly west since 1775 actually ground to a halt at the edge of this dry land by 1850. This is why the population stops where it does in this map. Um, and this region would not be settled until the 1870s and the 1880s when a whole new economy and an unusual set of rainfall years as well as um, cattle industry growing around railroads suddenly made it useful for a new kind of agriculture. So, the Far West was unusable farmland on the Great Plains. It was this waste space in a sense. But if you were lucky enough to get across the Great Plains moving westward, because remember you had to walk or ride a horse. Um, if you were lucky enough to get over them, you confronted this tangle of mountains 
arid plateaus, dry deserts, uncrossable canyons, salty inland lakes, like nothing you'd ever seen. This vast range of mountains, the Rockies, the Grand Tetons, the Wind River, Yellowstone, the Sierra Madre, the Cascades, Sierra Nav Nevada, I can go on. Um, it is 1300 miles from Denver at the far edge, western edge of the Great Plains to San Francisco across these mountains, the gold center of the Pacific, and just enormously dangerous land, difficult to cross. And while the population map showed zero, some fairly unfriendly indigenous tribes living in this region as well. Most of this land is arid and desert-like, except for the mountains and the Pacific Northwest, where there are these very high mountains with lots and lots of timber. So not a lot of good farmland here as well. There was very little that the far Western landscape had to offer to the agrarian dream that Jefferson had imagined back in the early 19th century. The far West could not be turned into settlements like those that had developed in the United States up to 1850. And this old model of families and communities maintaining some level of self-sufficiency in order to survive the ebbs and flows of the larger markets and their connections to it, um, it didn't work any longer. There was no agrarian foundation if a family couldn't grow and raise sufficient food and surplus staples for market participation. Right. So Jefferson's agrarian dream literally died on the edges of the Great Plains and, and the addition of another half a country with landscapes that were useless for agriculture um, really created a different puzzle altogether. Um, but that puzzle was being solved in 1850. In fact, we'll, we'll learn next time it had already been being solved in the East as well. Um, out West, the seedbed of the future is being planted in California, a new kind of society was beginning in the United States. One that required federal protection, one that depended on public lands that they would never own or they never intended to own, and one that engaged the American landscape in a brand new way. Um, and what I mean is mining. After 1850, mining um, and gold mining in particular remade the American frontier experience. Um, Rodman Paul, do I have him on here? Rodman Paul wrote a book about this uh, um, that where he studied this this sort of phenomena of this difference. That he said, you know, the frontier expansion um, in in the West, we're we're no longer talking about families and pioneers creating permanent new settlements, but we're talking about gold rushes pulling people into regions. Gold rushes and then the kinds of economies that follow gold rushes and successful mining of other minerals. Um, and in fact, what Paul argues is that under the conditions of the middle 19th century, this was the best first use for the whole region, right? It wasn't the agrarian dream of, excuse me, the East and the Midwest. Um, it was the gold mining gold mining culture dream of California that started in Cal started in 1849. Um, as I said, a fundamentally new frontier experience. Um, so we could think about the difference between a pioneer Ohio settler in 1800 and a California gold rush miner in 1850. In Ohio, pioneers came with their families to settle. In California, individuals, mostly men, came with a basic toolkit to pull gold out of the creeks and then leave. In Ohio, the land survey allocated square sections of relatively flat land to settlers who purchased and worked that land. In California, gold miners trespassed on public land, removed a valuable mineral, and moved on. And in fact, if you've ever traveled the Sierra, Mod Sierra Nevada of California, the scars are still there. In Ohio, settlers came to stay. They cleared forest, built farms, sectioned pastures, planted crops for their families and future generations. And in fact, we can say with all certainty, Ohio has been farmed by Americans since 1775. In California, the richest creeks were empty within five years, with some gold miners already beginning a, a movement eastward into the mountains in what would become a 20-year quest to uncover another gold find as rich as California 
and the West. Um, there might have seemed to have been for California gold rush miners more immediate money in gold mining, but the Ohio farmer is more stable because he's creating wealth and he's building it from the ground up. Um, so California, brand new frontier, brand new set of ideas about what's going on, gold mining leading the way. Um, the, the, the frontier activities changed, the ambitions changed with the opening of the far west. Also, the pattern of settlement such as it is changed as well. Shifting from this steady westering pushing frontier to a leapfrog over this mountainous region to San Francisco and then a gradual movement eastward and a movement eastward with gold mining as the frontier tool. Let's talk about gold mining a little bit. When I used to think about the gold rush, and unfortunately for all of you, I've written a book on gold mining in the West, so I thought way too much about this. Um, I used to think about this, the individual miner with a pan randomly moving across the landscape, finding gold, putting in his satchel, eventually coming to town and selling it and, and kind of living a life that way. A man, his mule, maybe his pack full of dried beef flour and lard. But the truth of Western mining is that there were rarely individuals mining alone. Um, how was gold found in the creeks, first of all, right? Because gold is actually buried underground. Most of the first finds, and in fact, the first one in California was accidental. Um, the song that we opened with today was about John Sutter and was singing about how they found gold in his mill race. That was a complete accident, um, but that drew this interest in. And then there was a much more intentional effort to find gold creeks. Um, first, there was a wave of miners from Georgia who had actually participated in the gold rush in Georgia in the 1830s. Um, but then the word got out through the president of the United States and the rush was on. And it was literally right away around these creeks, um, massively large groups of men. Um, and this was a very efficient way to mine out these creeks. So you very quickly, gold is not evenly distributed across the landscape. You find it in some places in the creek and not others. Some creeks have a long stretch of gold deposits, some have a short. You can't see any of it. But if you can put thousands of men to work digging up that whole creek all at once, you very quickly learn what the limits of that gold are. And that's what this approach did. It was an industrialization of these mining creeks. They were organized into these extra legal institutions called mining districts. And the men agreed among themselves to grab only a hundred, hundred feet stretch of the creek and only mine that. And then they positioned themselves up and down the creek and dug it out. And this was incredibly, well, you can see destructive, incredibly efficient and had nothing to do with individual lone prospectors going out on their own. It was always these large industrialized group of people and they would generally work the creek like beaver, busy beavers, and they'd be done, like I said, within five years. They'd finish getting all the gold out. And then some of these men would move on to, to other locations and see if they could strike their luck again. So 100,000 people packed into the center of California, 1849, 1850, or into San Francisco, which became the urban center supporting mining by 1850. And that number had quadrupled um, to 400,000 by 1860, and it would be 1.5 million by 1900. So California suddenly boomed in this period. California, well, we know today, California is a powerhouse in the United States. This is where it began, and it grew quickly and rapidly through the late 19th century, built atop this new society rooted in mining with gold leading the way. The gold that you find in the creeks is actually the result of weathering, right? The gold actually comes from ore that was up in mountains and that the weather just ran down the creeks and because of its weight collected it together at the bottom of the creek. Um, somewhere up in the mountains, except in the mother load of California, but everywhere else they found gold, somewhere up in the mountains, there was an ore body from which that gold came from, in which there was more gold or other minerals. And so in California, and then Nevada, and then across the West, 
some of the places that first got settled by this gold rush industrialization were found to contain gold in ore or silver in ore or some other metal in ore nearby these gold finds. And these places grew into what you're looking at here. And that's called hard rock mining. And that's sort of, there were, there were three phases of mining in the West. The first was the Placer Creek mining. The second was this, this very clearly industrialized hard rock mining. Um, and, and it involves going down into the ground after a buried ore body, building tunnels and, um, and extracting it and working it. So these are the gold deposits in the West, in case you were wondering where gold once existed. It was everywhere. And there were literally gold rushes across the West. None came close to the richness of the California gold fields, which you see here. Um, but there were these series of punctuated moves following the 1849 rush, really starting in the late 1850s, following these sequential discoveries of gold, um, and then, and so in this picture, just for the moment, ignore the railroads and the other trails and just look at the circles first, right? These are our major hard rock mining centers where gold drifted into silver uh, and then lead and copper in some instances. Um, there were literally only a handful of places that had enough of a deposit to warrant building this kind of a, a development, um, but they were all found by the 1870s. We knew where they were as a nation. And these major locations attracted railroads and turned into major mining centers, which became the core driver of the far western frontier settlement um, in this period. So six major gold rushes, punctuated stops over 30 years. These are the spots where there was enough gold for people to stay and then enough ore found in the surrounding mountains for people to follow. You see Nevada, Virginia City, Colorado, Pikes Peak in 1859, Oregon and Idaho City 61, Montana 1862, Black Hills 1872, Arizona, New Mexico in 1880. Okay, and all of these grew into hard rock and then industrial mining centers. Let's look at hard rock again for just a minute. Um, let's, this picture tells us an awful lot. If you look in the foreground on the left, on the right, and then you look in the upper right, um, you see there are pile upon pile upon pile of timber, fresh timber. All of this wood is going underground. All of that is going into the mine in order to hold open the tunnels where the ore has been removed or the tunnels where they're moving ore back and forth to a chute. Those, that timber makes the mine operable. And every single one of these hard rock mining developments that set up, and there were more of them than the six major centers, they were really wherever anyone found silver ore initially, these mining industries went through forests of timber, often deforesting, and you see this little bit of timber, not a whole lot around them everywhere, often deforesting the entire region around a working mine, and then needing more, right? They still had to get more. Um, and so they were, if were successful, a mining, hard rock mining facility was also suddenly creating tremendous demand for timber, which very quickly had to be transported to them from somewhere else. The other thing you see in this picture are 20 men, and there were probably another shift underground. So there are probably 40 men working at this site. This is a mining camp high in the mountains. Um, 20 men who spent their days mining. If they spent their days mining, they were not spending their days growing food, tending cattle, doing any of the things that would help them feed their hungry belly at the end of the day, right? And so these mining camps not only created this huge demand for timber, they created a huge demand for some of the staples of food um, to keep the men alive. Um, so timber, we see hard rock mining industry creates this instant demand and a Western timber industry starts around mining and the larger mining interests in the West. Eventually it would be taken over by larger corporations who put the transcontinental railroads out there, but with some of the same purposes in mind to have a timber industry to serve the mining industry first and foremost. Um, second, 
uh, was that when these started to go in, there was sufficient volume of material to be moved that it created a demand for railroads. And we see railroads coming, getting pulled into the region in order to serve and looking at these mining centers as their place of most important operation. Um, they had to bring equipment like air compressors and, and pumps and hoists and lifts, and they even built railroads inside their tunnels. So they needed to be able to move equipment in, and then they needed to be able to move heavy ore out. Um, and so hard rock mining accelerated railroad development across the far west. And in fact, we see most of the early transcontinentals were built to the major mining districts and then built branches out to other hard rock mining concerns. Um, so railroad is being shaped by mining out there. The demand for food really kind of came in two places. One, it was a demand for flour. Like that's what most of these miners lived off of was flour that they made themselves or somebody made into bread. And so we see in, in the valleys, in and around these mining districts, a wheat industry starting to grow up. This will eventually take over the Great Plains when a new ir irrigation regime is found for the Great Plains. But the demand for it is coming from these mining centers. And then beef and dried beef was what mostly what these men ate as well. And we see a Western beef industry growing up in these regions as well and starting in service to the miners themselves. Um, now, the mining districts and the camps eventually um, became kind of a much created a much larger reach out into the region, but this was the frontier engine that transformed all of this space after 1850, filling it in um, in a really unique way. We'll see in a minute. Um, the railroads we'll see out here covered much greater distances than in the West, and they were in covering those distances because the kinds of things we were doing there were much more valuable and much more specific compact places. That's what mining creates, um, almost these mini urban centers. Um, and then the completion of these railroad routes in turn accelerated the growth of these mining centers. So there was kind of a back and forth with that. The mining centers came up through the railroads and then the railroads added exponential market connection to all of these. And the largest loads of all, those six that I talked about, all of which are essentially mined out at this point, um, got under the industrial um, uh, uh, production. The Western mines of Montana with copper, Northern Idaho with lead and silver, Arizona and Utah, both with copper as well, Colorado with lead and silver, and then South Dakota, that Deadwood Gulch, you see gold from gold ore um, thousands of feet down in the ground. These railroads also then suddenly opened the Great Plains to cattle grazing. And <clears throat> We suddenly see in the 70s and 80s, as the, as the transcontinental railroads get finished, British money starts getting invested in cattle, which are out on public land growing in the Great Plains. And they um, essentially misplace, displace the bison that were out there. Cattle, the basic pattern was these investors would invest in thousands of head of cattle and a few cowboys and the cattle will be allowed to graze a season or two, and then they would be rounded up and driven. And these are some of the, the cattle paths north to the railheads in Kansas. Um, thousands upon thousands of cattle who would be loaded onto cattle cars for transport to the massive feedlots that were then growing up in Chicago. So this sudden new use of the Great Plains and on a national level, once these railroads are out there. Um, the railroads also enhanced the wheat growth. A, a, an unusual environmental event though, actually sort of led to this happening and led to pushing wheat farming, which existed like right at the edge of the Great Plains. In the late 1870s, early 1880s, there were about five years of extensive rainfall. And there was a mantra among farmers, which was that the rain will follow the plow. And for about five years, it appeared to. And so in response to these railroads, an enormous wheat industry also grew up too far into the Great Plains to be sustainable over time, um, but very successful for several years. And as well, it was thousands of acres being put under the plow um, and being harvested. And then um, at these locations, okay, here we go, at these locations, 
the, the most important locations, the scale of the mineral processing um, it exceeded anything we'd ever seen on earth. The mineral industry in the United States exploded in the 30 years between 1880 and 1910. And we're looking at some of the largest smelters in the world that were located out in the American West and that were producing an enormous surplus of material. Um, the lower left is the Anaconda Washoe smelter, which I studied closely in my doctoral dissertation. They were producing so much copper, they drove down the price of copper low enough to make Thomas Edison imagine electricity would be affordable. Um, this is the kind of impacts they were beginning to have on the Eastern economy. Um, lead and silver as well, silver going into the currency, lead um, being used in ammunition and being used for the military. Um, so all of a sudden, by the 1880s, 1890s in this region, we have these huge urban industrial cores, these cities that are employing thousands of men um, who are working at mining and smelting these enormous amounts of ore and which are drawing this other economy and growing this other economy around them, around the railroad, around timber, around flour and around beef. A new economy built entirely on the rapid transportation and the, uh, of, of railroads and the fossil fuel energy of coal. Railroads made increasingly out of the metals from the abundant mines that are being exploited, uncovered, and produced. Um, and, and a society that is exponentially growing in its consumption of natural resources at a rate that is just unprecedented, um, again, in human history, and producing these natural resources even faster. Um, now, we often think about the West as this space of natural resources, as abundant natural resources. But th the fact of the matter is, as this story is trying to tell you, they only became abundant with these developments. They only became abundant with the investment of, of coal energy and mining energy into hard rock mining and railroads and all of the infrastructure and the people who came along with them. They weren't valuable on their own. Um, but this process essentially created this vast Western resource colony for what was an increasingly intensively industrializing world to the East. Um, and, and the far West fell into this role on a national level, um, evolving into the kind of prime resource colony for the East and, and the source of its timber, its flour, um, and its meat in particular. Um, very famous book by a gentleman named William Cronin called Nature's Metropolis, in fact, looks at this scale of development. Um, and, and he studied Chicago, um, which he says was the first major urban center for the far west itself, the great urban core for the far west. He was interested when he wrote this book in tracing the way that nature came into the economy, became second nature and came into modern life itself. And he was interested in showing how Chicago wasn't an isolated place, but was intimately connected through these resource connections out into the far west. Um, he also revealed the kind of motor of development of this frontier um, that I've been describing now for the last half hour or so. Um, it's a pattern of settlement we might call urban industrial, an urban industrial landscape system, a pattern of settlement that first started around the mining camps and around the mining districts, but becomes replicated on a regional and national scale. And we can see this with the example of Chicago. Um, it's a pattern of an urban core of markets commanding the resources of rural industrialized places that are producing for that market. The whole thing is industrialized. Neither the rural nor the urban escapes industrialization or the energy regime of fossil fuel. And every city in the country exerts this kind of market demand into the rural spaces that surround it. This is the modern pattern the modern pattern of consumption and industrialization. And all of these populated places together actually make this whole space, this green nation you see, a core market demand for the whole global economy, right? And that's what we've become, is we're like 
a city, but we're like the city of the world in that we are a market that demands resources. Um, and the, these are the, the high points of that. Now we go back to um, 1850 for a moment and look at these demographics. And then let's fast forward to 1900. I'm gonna do that a couple of times. 1850, 1900. 1850, 1900. So what we see there is that the East continues to intensify on the patterns it had already established in its agrarian settlement on its, on its organic economy, um, but it had built on top of that a new demand and development. And the West, we can see it didn't settle in the same way. Its population patterns are nothing like the settlement patterns of the East. And you can see it's an extension of railroad markets and people producing along the edges of these murals, these industrialized, rural, natural resource production spaces, starting with the places where minerals can be found. Um, the far west was a resource colony. That's what it had become in this period of time. What we might call, again, an urban industrial landscape system where urban markets give shape to rural productive activities. And in this case, it was minerals and metals first, which drew in timber and lumber. And the men there created demand for grains and for meat. Um, and just as a side note, all of the landscape that's intensively developing back in the East has got a third economic factor that begins to emerge by the end of the 19th century. And that's the value of real estate. And the value of real estate has become a huge factor in American success um, from the late 19th century forward. And it's also critically a part of this urban industrial system as urban places get more full, the availability of real estate gets more dear, the prices go up. In New York City now, you're paying for air. You're paying for a, a chunk of air, 10 stories in the air. I mean, it's amazing what we've done with real estate since that point in time. But that we just want to note that the value of land and all of this starts to become a factor in economic success as well. So this urban industrial landscape system, which is already underway by the 1860, and we'll talk about this next time a little bit, already underway and obvious to people, clearly reshaping the West in a fundamentally new way by the 1870s, 1880s. But interestingly, this was the idea right in the middle of this period that was and still is considered kind of one of the most famous um, encapsulations of the kind of American ideal of its own development um, right in the right in the middle of this time and and so we can we can read it just a little bit right this is a this is an image first of all there's something sacred and all she's reading a her book is an education book so she's a sacred teacher um, but she's also stringing the telegraph communication line but but he's imagining this as a, as a as a settlement process that continues to be led by individuals and small groups there's no sense of the industrialization um, it, or, or this sudden rapid change in 1850. Um, because of the kind of symbols of this painting, we see that there's this sense of divine mission to educate, right? Moving from the light on the right side of the painting to the darkness in the West on the left side of the painting. Everyone in this picture has hand tools. There's no industrial imagination, um, only railroads. Um, and the urban and the rural, which are actually the center of development by the time John Gast is painting this, are depicted as New York, the far east. And they're filled with light, right? And native people in the west are still dark, right, in need of the change. Um, so it suggests something sacred about American progress as well. And, and you want to ask yourself, because I think this is hidden in our own cultural memories of the United States, whether it's accurate or not. Does it, is, is it an accurate rendition of what actually happened in the second half of the 19th century? Um, and you might also ask yourself why 
if the answer is no, because for me, the answer is no, this, this really masks a whole lot of activity really quite well. Why would John Cass tell this story this way? And why would Americans like this story better than the one I just told, which was actually happening? Okay, so just be, be asking yourself that. And then let's remember that at the end of this period, Turner said, the American frontier has closed. At the end of this, at the end of the 50 years, he said the American frontier had closed. And he said the American frontier, which he described in 1890 as the agrarian frontier of the Thomas Jefferson years. He said that frontier is what had made American noble and virtuous. And that that frontier disappeared in 1890. Um, but I want to suggest that frontier was already gone by 1850. And that Turner was 50 years too late in longing for a settlement frontier that was going to create the agrarian ideal in the United States. And then it begs the question, if that thesis is correct, and that's both Thomas Jefferson's agrarian uh, uh, pastoralism, you might call it, and um, Frederick Jackson Turner's frontier thesis. The thesis says the engagement with wilderness by American citizens, the turning of wilderness into civilization creates virtue. If that's correct, then what did we become under a mining system in the second half of the 19th century? Because we were up to something fundamentally different. Was this a switch in the American identity that Frederick Jackson Turner fundamentally missed um, and caused a larger misunderstanding about who we are? Um, we certainly can say that this is a culture that is no longer, and I pointed this out at the beginning, um, unwilling to take other countries into its colonial. It, it is an empire by the turn of the century. It becomes an empire by the turn of the century. And becoming an empire in this way is antithetical to the founding ideals of American republicanism and the ideals that Thomas Jefferson was forwarding with his agrarian pastoralism. And so the evidence is we became a different country in these 50 years, that the way in which the American nation inhabited its far Western frontier between 1850 and 1900 created a fundamental transformation in the American identity because that frontier was a mining frontier and not a farming frontier. And that is the end. Um, happy to answer any questions. We've got a couple of minutes here if there's anything that was unclear. And then your next task after this is to um, take the lecture quiz, which Ives, I'm not sure when that becomes available for them. But first, any questions? That was a whole lot of material. Anything that was confusing, I can help with. Uh, would the gold rush, would it have been possible without like, or would it have lasted as long or been as successful without the industrial revolution? Well, we'll see next time. It, it played into bo both, but um, it couldn't have been as successful if there wasn't as much industrialism already happening in the East but it then fed the industrial revolution. So it became, um, and again, I'll talk about this next time, it became the economic basis for the growth of the Midwest. Okay. Yeah, and most of that work, just so you know, was, was work that people had done for a thousand years in mining. There was nothing new in the mining techniques that placer mining were engaged in. And it was mostly wood um, uh, that they were using for their mining as well. Okay, Ives has told us the quiz is available at 11 a.m. Any other questions? Do you mind respecifying what the Spanish-American War was? Yes, and I'll get into this. We'll get into a little more detail in the political, but um, the United States went to war for about a year with Spain um, over a conflict that began in Cuba, 
um, and the, the blowing up of the Maine, which exploded. Teddy Roosevelt invaded Cuba with the with the Rough Riders in 1898. But they we we attacked Spain in Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. The Philippines was a Spanish colony. Um, and drove them out and essentially took all of those spaces over as our colonies. But it was, a, it, was, um, it was an early expression of American imperialism. And so it was a very new thing for us to do as a nation. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. Great. Any other questions? I just want to say that I joined about two minutes late. I just want to make sure you know that I'm here. Okay. Hey, Princeton. Hi. Thanks. All right. Well, your quiz should be available. Um, and so you're welcome to check out of the class at this point. And I will see you all Monday is a holiday. I will see you all one week from today. We'll talk about the economic theme for the same period of time. And then I will also say the lecture will be available uh, within, within a day. Need to see it again. I have a question that's relevant, but off topic if nobody else has a question. Please go ahead, Noah. So like, I'm a big Florida guy. And then, like, I'm a big Key West guy, big Jimmy Buffett guy, huge Jimmy Buffett period head. But make a long story short, how does the Conch Republic fit into this all this exploitation? Because I like, I actually have Florida? a yeah, like the Conch Republic. I don't know if you've never first. Okay, well, because it, because I it was like a Key West thing, and there's like a I have a actual flag of it in my room oh, <laughs> like 18, 1828 it said but since we were well so it would have florida was a territory starting in 1819 okay. and so that would have been the first and the thing about florida is like except for the beaches and the coastal it's pretty brutal unless you're doing something like cattle